today, the stupidity factor. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today I wanted to do a deeper dive into some of the really stupid things that are going on at the moment, economically speaking, because I think stupidity has been turned up to, well, probably 11 plus. And it's really quite amazing to see some of these things going on at the moment. So, for example, AMC Entertainment World True to Form, it ended its wild week with another day of moves that confounded anyone trying to explain them. The new king of the meme stocks bounced between gains and losses, closing 6.7% lower at $47.91 on Friday, but it's still up 83% on the week, adding to May's 160% surge. Of course, it's been quite a ride for AMC, with the stock's surge enabling the world's biggest movie theatre chain to sell equity and shore up its shaky balance sheet. On the brink of bankruptcy only a few months ago, the company is now the darling of retail traders, with this year's 2,200% gain ranking as the most of any stock in the Russell 3000 index. GameStop Corp, which started the mem stock craze back in January, is a distant second, with an advance of just 1,300%. So the interesting question which we have to ask is when does the bubble pop? I don't know, said Eric Handler, entertainment analyst at MKM Partners, who has a $1 target for AMC shares and sees no link between the current price and what's actually going on at the company. I have no idea when fundamentals will matter again, he said. Investors haven't been deterred by the fact that AMC is still losing money, bleeding cash and facing a mountain of debt, as well as heavy competition. It seems a lot like the dot-com craze of two decades ago to Ed Moyer, senior market analyst at Onda Corp. But on steroids, the swings are greater and everything is happening in a much shorter time period, he said. What makes this trading environment crazier is that the retail trader has a better chance to hold their own against the big boys now that they have low costs and have coordinated moves targeting only a handful of stocks. On Thursday, AMC tumbled a 18% after disclosing plans to sell more stock. The company collected $587 million from the sale, which came just days after it netted $230.5 million by selling equity to Muldrick Capital Management. The company later said it was asking investors for permission to sell 25 million new shares in 2022, a 95% cut from a previous plan that was withdrawn because of shareholder opposition. AMC's rally has led to warnings about investing at these elevated levels, perhaps the most dire one from the company itself. They said, we believe that the recent volatility in our current market price reflects market and trading dynamics unrelated to our underlying business or macro or industry fundamentals, and we do not know how long these dynamics will last. Under the circumstances, we caution you against investing in our Class A common stock unless you are prepared to incur the risk of losing all or a substantial portion of your investment. Well, that can't be much clearer, can it? In fact, more broadly, about $40 billion of at-the-market offerings have been announced this year in the US, according to recent data from Bloomberg. That windfall is on pace for the biggest year ever, and it's already surpassed the annual tally for every year on record except 2020, when retail training ballooned during the thick of pandemic lockdowns. Meme stocks like Hertz Global Holdings and Tesla bought one at the market offerings after another, 
while their stocks rose even as the pandemic battered balance sheets. AMC Chief Executive Officer Adam Arum told shareholders that AMC may face challenges or exciting opportunities post-pandemic and needs precious shares to issue if such a situation arises. The company also dismissed speculation of a stock split. AMC took the best possible path of action and used the bloated share price to raise lots of capital for its own purposes. Joachim Clement, a strategist at Librem, said by email, meme stock investors need the share price to be volatile and the stock to make headlines because if the attention disappears, then so does their investment. The frenzied rally has pushed AMC shares to improbable levels. The company now has a market value of about $25 billion. That's bigger than 40% of the listings on the S&P 500 index. AMC is nowhere near worth what the market is currently pricing it at. And over time, it should be a lot lower, said Michael Hewson, chief market analyst at CMC Markets. How it gets there is anybody's guess. AMC shares have surged to nearly 10 times the average analyst price target. When Bush raised its price target to $7.50 from $6.50 on Friday, a level that implies an 84% plunge from the last close. And analyst Elisa Reese said the firm has made the best of its recent surge by selling shares to raise cash, but called its current price out of touch with the company's fundamentals. She said the stock will see continued significant volatility and doesn't recommend buying shares. The average analyst target is just about $5.25. AMC's stock sales helped raise $1.25 billion in the second quarter, bringing its cash hoard to almost $2 billion. But this can take the cinema change recovery only so far if audiences don't come back in force. It still has to deal with pre-pandemic problems such as competition from streaming and a crushing debt load that helped produce losses in two out of the last three years preceding the COVID-19 outbreak. Another chunk of cash may go to landlords who want AMC to pay $470 million in back rent that it skipped while its theatres were closed. What's more, the company backed away on Thursday from plans for a much bigger share sale in the face of fierce opposition from its army of retail investors. This is mitigating the risk of further dilution this year and likely appeasing retail investors, but also highlights the need for a strong box office recovery, Bloomberg intelligence analyst said in a recent note. Aaron told analysts during an earnings conference called in May that streaming isn't the same thing as going to see a movie at, at big screen theatres and raiding the concession stand. People have been so deprived of something that they love. People love going to the movies, he said. People want the whole experience. Now, the market is big enough for apes and tortoises, with plenty of room for the army of primate traders chasing a 2,000% gain in AMC Entertainment and the quiet majority gradually sliding money into stock funds to harness a regular old economic expansion. The self-described apes who've helped AMC go bananas, making it by far the most actively traded issue on the stock and options market, have followed the roaring kitty-led stampede into GameStop a few months ago to become the fixation of Wall Street and prompt the same vexed questions. Much like the initial eruption of buying by Robin Hood armed amateur speculators last year, the video game style viral action in AMC and the company's unapologetic cultivation of retail traders to raise billions in new equity this year has generated so much hand-wringing and lip pursing amongst market observers that it's possibly spread more cautionary sentiment than contagious recklessness. The apes may be agitated and at some point will probably make their targeted stocks treacherously unstable with an excess of hot money. But the market's tortoises are also being quite aggressive in their own manner, meaning that flows into long-term equity funds have been enormous and persistent all year. And there are consequences. Index funds are supposed to cut out the human-driven craziness that periodically affects markets. But recent mean stock fever proved the $11 trillion industry is far from immune. The remarkable surge in shares of AMC Entertainment Holdings and a handful of other stocks is showing up in multiple exchange-traded funds, skewing portfolios, altering risk profiles and exerting outsized influence on prices. Take the $68 billion iShares Russell 2000 ETF. In the past week, 
through to Thursday, AMC powered 70% of the product's advance. The stock was responsible for less than a tenth of the fund's return in the previous week. It's a timely reminder that even diversified funds on autopilot remain subject to the whims and eccentricities that frequently lash markets out of nowhere. For index investing, the appeal is that human decision-making, human emotions are taken out of it, said Thomas A., a former Merrill Lynch trader who founded the Sevens Report newsletter. That works all well and good until a stock that is supposed to be a 50 basis point of the funds now becomes 60%. The AMC effect can also be seen across a range of funds alongside IWM, the 17.5 billion iShares Russell 2000 Value ETF and the 72 billion iShares Core S&P Small Cap ETF have also seen the stock's influence climb. A similar phenomenon took place in January when GainStop Corp at one point surged more than 1,600%. Shares of the video game retailer also rallied alongside AMC in the past week. The two companies are among a handful of shares dubbed meme stocks that are enjoying rapid social media fueled gains. Once the rules have been drawn up in the land of indexing, once the play has been called in the huddle, you don't have that discretion, said Ben Johnson, Morningstar's global director of ETF research. You take whatever the market is going to give you and execute the plays. The difference now is that investors have poured billions of dollars into products tracking smaller and cheaper stocks in the past six months, part of a broad rotation into more growth-sensitive companies to ride an economic recovery from COVID-19. Inflows to value ETFs have already surpassed last year's total. At the same time, meme mania is bigger than ever alongside AMC and GameStop companies including BlackBerry, COS and Bed Bath & Beyond also saw huge moves in the past week. Even in a basket of 2,000 stocks, you're getting some systemic risk around this concept of retail meme stocks because they're small enough to push around, said Nick Colas, co-founder of Data Trek Research. The cash and chaos exposes a glitch in the plumbing of many funds, which is that they're often tied to the rebalancing schedule of the index they follow. Given the speed of the rallies in the likes of AMC and GainStop, even tracking an index that rebalances quarterly, that's a relatively frequent schedule by industry standards, leaves a fund susceptible to distortion. And one of the most dramatic examples occurred in May, though it was unrelated to the meme fuel drama. Around 68% of the 14.5 billion iShares MSCI USA Momentum Factor ETF had to be changed because of the huge market rotation that occurred since its last semi-annual rebalance. For quants, who like to slice and dice stocks by characteristics like how expensive they appear or how much their prices swing around, known as factors, it's all known as style drift. The fund is drifting away from its strategy or investing style. Now elsewhere, in another example of some stupidity, lumber futures gyrated in wild trading on Wednesday, as traders struggled to determine if a recent pullback in wood prices had removed enough froth from the market. Lumber futures for July delivery at first fell 5% to $1,201 per thousand board foot on Wednesday morning, only to turn positive and rally 5% by the afternoon. Prices hit what's known as limit down and then limit up. That's the maximum percentage change allowed by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange where the futures trade. Prices have fallen every day since lumber hit a record of $1,711 per thousand board feet on May the 10th. Despite the swoon, the price of lumber is still up around 37% in 2021. Prices stifle demand, period. There's no other question about it, Robin Cross, a commodities broker at Stonex, said of the recent pullback from highs. It's not like I have a whole bunch of guys calling and selling it. What's really happening is guys bought a high-priced inventory and they're afraid to add to it. No one wants to get left holding the $1,700 bag. Tens of thousands of stuck-at-home homeowners and new home builders have for much of the last year snapped up processed pine by the tonne, but more recently, with sawmills unable to keep up with demand as the calendar turned to spring, a speculative frenzy entered the market with traders bidding up prices aggressively since March. Single-family housing starts dropped 
13% in April in the US, the biggest decline since the COVID pandemic hit. And the rise in lumber costs was partly to blame for home builders slowing production even as housing demand increases. Cross explained that while lumber looked overbought as recently as earlier this month based on price and technical metrics, he said its recent pullback is starting to appear overdone in the opposite direction. I do believe that in the markets we are going to see a dead cap bounce. When the market got up to $1,733, that was the most overbought lumber market in history. Technically speaking, not just on price, he said, it's now sitting at $1,201 and a singular straight line downward. It's not quite the most oversold market in history, but it's pretty damn close. While the rules for reaching limit down prices vary by asset classes, reaching that level in commodity markets can be especially stressful for traders who are unable to sell their positions because trading on exchanges are halted as soon as the limit down price is met. Lumber futures limit price down on May the 19th was $63, according to the CME Group. And lumber futures on Chicago's Mercantile Exchange fell 3.1% to 1,284.20 per 1,000 board feet, extending last week's first loss since January. The last 18 trading sessions, lumber prices have come under pressure amid signs that an unprecedented rally may be waning. Citing data from trade publication Random Length, CRBC analyst Hamir Patel told Bloomberg that Western Spruce pine fir prices decreased $130 or down 8.1% compared to last week's $1,470 per 1,000 board feet. And southern yellow pine 2x4 lumber dropped $92 or down 6.9% to 1236 per 1,000 board feet. The decline comes among a drop in lumber futures, which have tumbled into a bear market down 25% in recent weeks from an all-time high reached earlier in May. This suggests that sawmills could be catching up amid the flurry of demand from North American home builders, along with supply chain issues which created massive supply constraints, which propelled lumber prices to record highs. Record softwood lumber prices amid an acute supply shortage appears unsustainable and may correct sharply from a level that's quadruple the 10-year average, according to Bloomberg's analysis. But with lumber prices adding tens of thousands of dollars to new residential bills, some builders have paused or even halted new construction. Republican Bob Gibbs from Ohio, who serves on the House Oversight Committee's Environment Subcommittee, told Fox Business that increasing lumber prices are just one of the many indicators that President Biden is failing American workers. Lumber prices are an issue that has many causes from economic complications from the coronavirus pandemic to difficult trade issues with Canada. Biden has shown he is either unwilling or incapable of tackling these obstacles, he said. And last week, Patel told Bloomberg that even though home renovations are easing, lumber prices could maintain around the $1,000 handle through 2021. Despite the latest pullback, prices are likely to remain elevated until the Federal Reserve begins or at least signals that it will start to taper. It's $40 billion per month in mortgage-backed securities purchases. And the group of seven rich nations secured a landmark deal that could help countries collect more taxes from big companies and enable governments to impose levies on US tech firms such as Amazon and Facebook. The agreement by the G7 finance ministers in London satisfies a US demand for at least corporate tax rate minimums of 15% on foreign earnings and paves the way for levies on multinationals in countries where they make money instead of where they just happen to be headquartered. The deal is aimed at modernising the century-old international tax code and cools transatlantic tensions that threaten to spill into a trade war under Donald Trump. But key details are still to be nailed down. More nations must sign on and full implementation could take years. US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, among the finance chiefs who hailed the announcement as an unprecedented step, said a final accord on which companies could see their profits taxed outside their home countries 
would include the likes of Amazon and Facebook. What you're seeing is a revival of multilateralism, a willingness of leading nations in the G7 and G20 to cooperate to address the most critical challenges facing the global economies, Yellen said after the meeting. Focus will now shift to a July meeting of the group of 20 finance ministers in Italy and long-running talks between the 140 countries at the OECD. The G7 pact makes a step to rewrite a global system that critics says allow big companies to save billions of dollars in tax bills by shifting jurisdictions. It also helps to address complaints that major digital companies can make money in multiple countries and pay taxes only at home. In response to the announcement, some of the world's biggest tech companies focused on how the deal could help clear up the rules and where to pay taxes. Today's agreement is a significant first step towards certainty for businesses and strengthening public confidence in the global tax system, Facebook's global affairs vice president Nick Clegg said on Twitter. An Amazon spokesperson said the OECD-led processes will help bring stability to the international tax system and described Saturday's deal as a welcome step towards an effort to achieve this goal. Under the Trump administration, the US has refused to allow foreign governments to tax American digital companies, a key European demand. The transatlantic division spiralled into a battle of unilateral measures and threats of trade sanctions, which, although suspended, are still in place. According to the communique, after the London meeting, countries where big firms operate will get the right to tax at least 20% of profits exceeding a 10% margin. That would apply to the largest and most profitable multinational enterprises, potentially enabling the G7 to square the circle so that digital is included without being targeted. Asked whether that means companies like Facebook and Amazon would be included, Yellen said yes, they would qualify by almost any definition, and most of those firms are likely to be included in this new scheme. The ministers of the UK and France both said that they were now assured that tech giants would be in the crosshairs of the new rules, even as the final quantitative criteria was still being determined. We've been fighting for four years in all European and international forums here at the G7 and at the G20 for a fair taxation of digital giants and for a minimum corporate tax, France's finance minister Bruno Le Main said. The antipathy in recent years was greatest between Paris and Washington. France was the first country to bypass the slow-going OECD processes on how to tax profits, opting for a controversial levy exclusively on the digital revenues of large firms. And the G7 said that countries would provide for appropriate coordination to remove such digital services taxes. Resolving the exact sequencing of that could prove tricky, with countries unwilling to give up revenues before they have certainty over what they will gain from new global rules. Italian Finance Minister Daniel Franco said he'll aim to broaden the discussion when G20 finance ministers meet in July in Venice. Once the proposal is agreed, Italy will no longer need its digital tax, he said. Highlighting other remaining divisions, the Finance Minister of Ireland, whose country has attracted some of the world's big businesses with low taxes, said any deal on a minimum rate must meet the needs of small and large countries developed and developing. And pushing the other direction, Le Maire said the 15% is a starting point and France would fight for a higher rate in the coming weeks. The administration of US President Joe Biden still needs approval from Congress and will hope the deal hands it leverage on its massive infrastructure program. It is seeking support from lawmakers to raise the domestic corporate tax rate to 21%. An international deal for 15% could help him because it offers multinationals options. The OECD has said a final global deal may not come until October, with delivery requiring nations to pass the plan through national legislatures. There is important work left to do, said OECD Secretary-General Matthias Kuhlmann, but this decision adds important momentum to the coming decisions. And Rishi Sunak, the UK finance minister and meeting host, said after years of discussion, G7 finance ministers have reached a historic agreement to reform the global tax system to make it fit for the global digital age. After an estimate of how much the agreement could raise for Britain, Sunak replied, this is the first step. This is 
the agreement reached at the G7, we still need it to go to the G20 and reach agreement with a broader group of countries. So it's hard to say where the final deal will land. Now, it's worth just reflecting on this. The campaign group at Oxfam said it's absurd for the G7 to claim it is overhauling a broken global tax system by setting up a global minimum corporate tax rate that is similar to the soft rates charged by tax havens like Ireland, Switzerland and Singapore. They are setting the bar too low that companies can just step over it. Stopping the explosion in inequality caused by COVID-19 and tackling the climate crisis will be impossible if corporations continue to pay virtually no tax. This is not a fair deal. The G7 can't expect the majority of the world's countries to accept crumbs from its table. Now, to my mind, the setting of a global tax minimum is a small step forward, but we need something much more radical because the fair share is for corporations to pay a lot more tax relative to consumers and households who are frankly picking up the lion's share of tax payments around the world. So what they should have done was to do two things. One, impose a financial transaction tax on every single transaction, just a few cents, would have raised a huge amount and also taken some of the frothiness out of the current financial markets. And the second is they should be taxing corporations on turnover rather than profit, because then, of course, those who actually get bigger pay more, which seems to me a whole lot fairer. But there again, that's a bit too radical for where we are. So stupidity continues to drive narrow incremental change that will actually make very little difference in my view. Now let's finally just talk about inflation because it's probably here to an extent, although as I discussed with Damien Klassen, although maybe just tactically speaking, rather than structural. But it's worth thinking about what this inflation stuff is actually doing. Because if inflation does arrive and higher interest rates follow, much could be to the delight of savers who have endured rock bottom returns on cash and on other safe investments since the Great Recession. But inflation is a double edged sword. Higher prices that consumers pay for goods and services may completely gobble up their extra savings. It's one of those things where the interest rate gives with one hand and inflation takes away with the other, according to Christine Benz, a director at Personal Finance at Morningstar. Consumer prices jumped 4.2% in April in the US from a year earlier. That's the biggest bump since 2008. On one hand, that acceleration does make sense because a year ago the COVID pandemic buckled the US economy and inflation was low. With the COVID threat waning, consumer demand, along with some supply shortages, is pushing up prices in certain sectors. But it's unclear if the dynamic is temporary or something more permanent. The latter would generally lead the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates in order to increase borrowing costs and hopefully keep the economy from overheating. Rates on savings accounts, and money market funds and certificates of deposit, for example, would likely tick up instead of being the equivalent of mattress money with practically no yield, according to Diane Lace, managing principal at PPAC Private Wealth Management in New Providence, New Jersey. However, consumers might funnel those returns to living expenses like rent, food, transportation and health insurance if they swell in price, she said. Indeed, some companies have raised prices recently for household items like toilet paper, peanut butter and soft drink. All of these things obviously have a major impact, said Lessus, a certified financial planner and accountant. There are a few times in history when savers derive a negative net return after accounting for inflation. In 1980, for example, a benchmark 10-year Treasury bond yielded an average of 11.43% among its highest ever. That return beats out of the roughly 10% average analysed returns of stocks as measured by the S&P 500 index, by the way. However, a 13.5% inflation rate in 1980 more than cancelled out those stellar earnings, yielding a loss of about 2%. And that's before tax. If Uncle Sam took a third of earnings, the investor would have lost nearly 6% of spending power, according to Alan Roth, a CFP and accountant at WealthLogic in Colorado Springs, Colorado. The purpose of the portfolio is to give you choices in life, Roth said, and inflation and taxes eat away 
at these choices. In fact, a low inflation, low interest rate environment like the pre-pandemic dynamic was optimal for consumers from a tax perspective, Roth said. That's because the US tax system is based on nominal instead of net investment returns. Of course, there are some caveats. If inflation turns out to be temporary, as some officials predict, the Fed may not raise interest rates anytime soon. A limited period of pandemic-related price increases are unlikely to durably change inflation dynamics, Federal Reserve Governor Lyle Brainard said in a speech last month. And the market's expectations for inflation rather than the Fed policy have a much greater bearing on investments like the 10-year Treasury, with a longer time horizon, according to finance advisors. Plus, inflation doesn't necessarily impact all goods and services equally. Some consumers may be hit more than others. If inflation is here to stay, though, there will be some winners and some losers. If you owe money, inflation is a very good thing, Ross said, for consumers with loans. If people owe you money, inflation is a very bad thing. For example, a bond is essentially an IOU with interest. Someone holding a low interest bond or CD with a 10 year or longer time horizon may be stuck with a paltry return and watch from the sidelines as other investors jump into higher yielding bonds. On the other hand, a homeowner who's locked into a fixed mortgage at a low interest rate is in a good position. Their home value would likely inflate, but their monthly loan repayments would stay the same. That's kind of a ray of sunshine for those who own houses, Lasses said. Rising inflation might also be a challenge for seniors, especially for those on a fixed budget who get most of their income from investments. There's one silver lining, though. Those who get the bulk of their income from Social Security are well situated since those monthly payments grow with the cost of living. And Americans who still are working may also receive a cost of living rise in their paychecks to reflect rising prices, Ben said. Relative investments, bond, mutual funds and exchange traded funds offer some additional flexibility, according to Lassus. Holding individual bonds, especially those with a term longer than seven years, is likely not a good idea for investors worried about inflation. She added, allocating perhaps 5 or 10% of one's bond portfolio to Treasury Inflation Protected Securities in the US, known as TIPS, also offers an inflation hedge. She said, stock funds don't offer a direct inflation hedge, but have historically outrun inflation by a comfortable margin over the longer term. So let's just recap stupidity relating to those MEM stocks, stupidity relating to short term changes to global tax systems that really don't answer the main question, and stupidity surrounding the old debate about inflation or deflation, and especially as we continue to believe inflation is likely to be temporary, means you need to be careful about what you do. So there's a dose of stupidity around the traps. I just wonder how many people will get caught by it in the months ahead. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next